Hello YouTube. We have been examining the system in modal logic known as K. Uh, K is a very interesting system, but there are many other systems of modal logic, many of which are even more important and, uh, and interesting. Okay, so uh, K itself is one of a larger family of systems known as the normal modal logics. Uh, the, the normal modal logics include K and its extensions, and then there's another family known as the non-normal modal logics, which are in various ways uh, weaker than K, but we'll uh, come to that in, in due course. For now we'll be exploring the normal modal logics, and we can generate normal modal logics by making slight alterations to our system K. Okay, so... Uh, Throughout these videos, we've been interpreting the box as representing necessity, uh, the diamond as representing possibility, and to provide the semantics for our logic, we have been using this concept of possible worlds. Uh, but in the system K, some very strange things follow from this. Uh, the most notable one, which I mentioned in my video, Modal Logic 1.3, uh, is is that in the system K you can have both necessarily A and not A be true in the same world, um, which is uh, pretty counterintuitive if you're interpreting the box as meaning necessarily. Uh, so it seems like like one natural alteration we might want to make would be to disallow this kind of thing. Um, so so we want to include in our in our logic, that if we have necessarily A, then you can derive A in the same world. Um, so that is, if if the value of A at if the value of necessarily A at uh, our world W zero is equal to one, then the value of A at this world W zero is also equal to one. That's essentially what we uh, one sort of alteration that we might want to make a, a natural alteration we might want to make. So, one way of generating um, new modal logics is to alter the accessibility relation. So, um, let's say that we keep all of our usual rules the same. All the propositional rules, all the modal rules, they're all exactly the same, we just alter the accessibility relation. What we need to do is make it reflexive. Uh, so that every world accesses itself. So in other words, for, for, for all our worlds, uh, Wx, um, Wx is accessible from Wx. That just means that every world is, is, accesses itself. So if you have some world, Wo, then Wo is accessible from Wo. Um, so uh, this, this would be commonly represented uh, with an arrow that starts at the world and circles back round but you know the arrow would sort of start here then circle round but since I'm just using PowerPoint uh, I'm going to draw an arrow from nowhere uh, to mean that that world accesses itself so that arrow from nowhere that just means that, that this world accesses itself um, and it should be pretty easy to see the effect that this will have on our necessity operator. Uh, remember how the rules for necessity work. If we have necessarily A in some world W, and we have an arrow to some other world, then we can derive A in that other world. But making the accessibility relation reflexive means that we, we always have such an arrow. It's just it goes to the same world. So if we have necessarily A, then under a, an ex, a reflexive accessibility relation, we can immediately derive A in the same world. Um, and it should be obvious from this that any formula of the form uh, if necessarily A, then A is valid. Any formula of that form is valid in this new system. What we are describing here is the system known as M, uh, sometimes called T. So uh, M or T is the name you will see given to this system. Uh, and uh, this formula here, if necessarily A, then A, that's the sort of characteristic formula of M. You know, that's, that's, that's the kind of formula that is often used to, to just characterize M. That's associated with this system. 
Um, and uh, M, we can define that as K plus reflexivity. So we take our system K and we add, or, or rather we alter the accessibility relation to make it reflexive. Doing that gives us this system M. And you can see the characteristic formula there. So uh, let's check another inference. Um, if necessarily A, then possibly A. This is this is another one that that would uh, that would seem like a perfectly reasonable inference that we want to we want this to work. Uh, so um, from the false conditional here we have a false conditional here. We can uh, we can derive necessarily A and not possibly A. And now in the system K, this is as far as we we would be able to go because if we were working in K, our world wouldn't actually access any other worlds. Um, so there would be nothing we could do. But in M, all worlds access themselves. So we can derive A from necessarily A, and we can derive not A from not possibly A, which of course gives us a contradiction. The tree closes, the formula is valid. So that's, uh, that's our system M. And there are other conditions that we might want to impose uh, on our accessibility relation. So that's that's reflexivity. Um, but another condition we might want to impose is symmetry. And symmetry says that if you have two worlds, uh, WX and WY, and WY is accessible from WX, then WX is accessible from WY. Um, basically this just means that whenever you draw an arrow to another world you make it a, a double-headed arrow both worlds access each other okay so here we have um, WO and W1 and we can see that W1 is accessible from WO symmetry means that we just draw an arrow back from W1 so that's what we can derive if the accessibility relation is symmetric then there's transitivity and transitivity says that if you have three worlds w x w y and w z such that w y is accessible from w x and w z is accessible from w y then w z is accessible from w x um, so let's have a look at that we have three worlds here you can see w1 is accessible from w o w2 is accessible from w1 if our accessibility relation is transitive, this means we can then draw another arrow from WO to W2, just like that, which uh, I think is reasonably simple. So uh, we've got three conditions here. We've got reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity. Uh, I would, I would, you know, write these down. It's important to remember all of these. Um, this, this stuff is quite important. Uh, I don't think it's too, too difficult. So we've seen uh, reflexivity in action. Let's take a look at symmetry in action. So um, we're taking our system K and making the accessibility relation symmetrical. So this is just the same as before. It's, just, it's K, but we, we say that if WY is accessible from WX, then WX is accessible from WY. So let's take the formula if P then necessarily possibly P. Uh, now, for reasons that will become clear in a later video, I'm going to use uh, the alternative truth tree method that I talked about in the last video for this, um, and you'll see why in when I sort of deal with these in more detail. Um, but just you know, just bear with me. This is good practice. Uh, okay then. So let, let's imagine we're in K and we uh, we have our false conditional here. Well, we can derive p and then we can derive not necessarily p um, and uh, then we can use this not necessarily possibly p to open up a new world so we write 0r1 and we put in there not possibly p uh, now if, if we were working in k uh, this is as far as we could go um, well we could if we want to um, apply one of the modal conversion rules to this to give to make uh, necessarily not not p but the point is we're basically stuck here we have no more rules to apply um, however since the accessibility relation is symmetric and since we we have uh, our world uh, w1 is accessible from w0 
uh, then we can we can write that our world zero is accessible from W1. So we can write one RO, and that means that we can put this not possibly P in in zero up here, which means we derive a contradiction in zero. I actually realised I uh, made a mistake in that truth tree. Just just realised that as I was saying it, uh, that should be a one there next to not possibly P. I'm sure you can. Um, you, you've probably worked that out. That was just a mistake. Uh, should have um, should have made that not possibly P one because that's in world one. We opened up a new world from our not necessarily possibly P. So sorry about that. But I don't think that's anything uh, too serious. I'm sure you realised what a terrible mistake I've made there. Okay. Anyway, you, you can see how that contradiction works. Uh, let's have a look at a transitive tree. Um, and just to keep you on your toes, I'm reverting to the other tree method again now, uh, swapping back and forward. So let's take if necessarily P, then necessarily necessarily P. Well, from the false conditional, we have necessarily P and not necessarily necessarily P. Uh, this allows us to open up a new world in which we have not necessarily P. Um, now, uh, in K, of course, we would have to use this necessarily P to put P in here. Uh, which is all same as usual. Um, and then we use this not necessarily to open up another world in which we have not P. Uh, and in our system, in, in K, this is as far as we could go. Okay, we, We've applied all the possible rules we can. The argument would be invalid. But now we're using a transitive accessibility relation. And since we have um, W1 accessible from W0 and W2 accessible from W1, we can derive that W2 is accessible from W0. So we draw a new arrow to W2. And that allows us to use this necessarily P to put P in W2, giving us a contradiction, closing the world. So that's a brief introduction to uh, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Um, you can mix and match these conditions in whatever way you want to generate new systems. But there are four systems in particular which are especially important in contemporary modal logic. The first is system M, which we've already encountered. Uh, this, takes K, uh, this takes K and adds reflexivity. Uh, next is the system B. And uh, B, like M, adds reflexivity to K. It also adds symmetry. Um, then there's S4. S4 adds both reflexivity and transitivity. And the, these are the sort of characteristic formulas of these systems. And then there's S5, which, is, which takes K and adds reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And that's the sort of characteristic formula of S5. It's a good idea to uh, try to remember all of this. I know that it looks a bit daunting at the moment. But once we start actually using these new systems, you learn them pretty quickly you know once you start kind of doing problems in them they you know you learn them really really quickly but uh, for now you know you just have to try to remember that these systems are important that you can mix and match the excess these different conditions any way you like but it's just that these systems happen to be kind of quite important ones these are the characteristic formulas of those systems um, actually you, you might have noticed certain equivalencies here uh, you know, reflex K plus reflexivity, K plus reflexivity. So it might be easier to remember them uh, this way. You know, B is M plus symmetry, S4 is M plus symmetry, and then S5 is all of them put together. Okay, um, we'll examine all of this in more detail in the next video, and we'll take a deeper look at using truth trees in these systems. But uh, I think that's enough for now. Um, again, I know that. That, that did seem like I breezed through it all really quickly, but I just want to, you know, sort of get these systems down and then we'll take um, a deeper look at them. So uh, maybe a bit, quite a bit of information to uh, absorb there, but I uh, hope that wasn't too bad. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.